Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Anna. We had some good guesses about what kaboomistry would be. Explosions, exciting things, chemistry. I'm going to turn it over to Anna and learn all about kaboomistry. So over to you, Anna. Thank you. Well, thank you guys so much for uh, joining us again. If we saw you a little earlier in the week for our Frostology program, um, I'm hoping you enjoyed it. and Maybe that's why you chose to come back for this session on kaboomistry. So if you guessed that we would be creating some explosions, maybe doing some chemistry, and talking about fire, all of those things are correct. Um, we won't be making atomic bombs here, but we will be making some safer explosions that I can do here in my basement studio. Um, so we'll be mixing together physics and chemistry in order to make a couple things go kaboom. Now, since we're talking about fire, Obviously, if we're talking about kaboomistry, uh, we should probably, before we start any of our reactions, before we do any kaboomistry, we should take a moment to talk about safety. Now, most of these experiments you cannot try at home. There is one experiment today that I will give you instructions on how you can try this experiment at home in order to make a safe explosion, but you should never play with fire at home. There are no exceptions to that rule. Um, even here today, I am not playing with fire, I am experimenting with combustion reactions. I have been trained on all these reactions. I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm taking all the appropriate safety precautions that I need to take to make sure that I am prepared if something does go wrong um, and to make sure that nothing does go wrong because I'm following good lab protocol. Now, you might notice that I'm taking a few safety precautions already. Um, so if you notice that I am doing something or wearing something, that is here for safety, tell me that in the chat. What am I already doing? Um, and then we'll talk about maybe the things that I'm missing. So talk about first, what am I already doing or what do I already have that is here for safety? People are told me that I have on my lab coat. Absolutely, so my lab coat, I'm gonna button it up right now, is here to protect my skin and my clothing. Now, this lab coat is made out of a special material that if fire were to catch on, on this lab coat, instead of melting, which could cause me more harm, would actually just burn right away. Um, and that's actually an important feature of a lab coat. Um, you also see that I have out my fire extinguisher. Um, so I do have my fire extinguisher here. I've actually never had to use it during a kaboomistry presentation, knock on wood. Um, and hopefully today is not that day, but in science, you always have to be prepared. We talked about in the case that something unexpected did happen. Um, we are prepared. So I do have my fire extinguisher here. Um, it is up to date, it is current, it is ready to go just in case I might need it. So we'll stay right there for the whole show. Um, we have, yep, lab coat, fire extinguisher. I saw someone mention goggles. I'm not wearing my goggles yet, but I do have them. So we'll put those on right now and I'm actually just not going to take them off for the entire program. So even while I'm not working with fire, um, I'm going to be safe. I'll just keep them on just so that I don't forget. Um, what else am I doing or what am I missing? What else? You think about parts of my body or my setup here. I see a great um, answer from Charlotte and from Evan that says that I should be wearing gloves. Um, so I have two different pairs of gloves. This is the most important pair of gloves that I'll wear today. So these are not those same cryogenic gloves that I wore during frostology because these are not here to protect me from cold. These are here to protect me from flames. And so I'll wear those when my hands are going to be near any of the flames we're working with today. Um, they're a little bit cumbersome, so I do need to take them off at some points just to set things up, but I'll always put them back on when I'm working with fire. Missing glove. Oh, and Beth, that's a great answer. I was actually gonna mention that one, Beth. Um, I did tie my hair back. I have very long hair um, and I would certainly not want to lean over the table and have my hair kind of fall into any of our combustion reactions. So I did tie my hair back here so it is nice and safe and out of the way. That's very, very important when you're working with combustion. Um, the very last thing we're going to do is all together, we're going to take a nice sacred, sacred oath all together. Um, this oath is legally binding. So you have to take it in order to participate in kaboomistry. Um, and then you have to follow it. So everyone go ahead and raise your right hand for me and repeat after me. Okay. I promise to never, ever, 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 ever,
her play with fire. All right, you can stop repeating after me. Hopefully you've all taken that oath at home because we are never, ever, ever going to play with fire at home or anywhere else. That is totally unsafe. One day if you'd like to work with combustion reactions, you should consider a career in science um, that uses it so that you can undergo safety training to do so safely. So today we'll be talking about a combustion reaction. A combustion reaction is basically what we call fire. So we dimmed the lights in my studio. So if you're noticing kind of some shadows back here um, and that my room is a little bit darker than normal, I did that intentionally because a combustion reaction is easier to see if we have a little bit dimmer lights. Um, it, a combustion reaction produces three things. It produces heat, light, and smoke sometimes. So if we're looking for those three things, we want the lights to be just a little bit dimmer so that we'll be able to observe that light portion. Um, you guys won't be able to observe very much smoke. I'll let you know if there is any from here. And you will not also be able to observe the heat, but I will be explaining that piece to you as well. So our first reaction that we'll do um, is just testing our observation skills. So I figure before we really get into the content, would you guys like it if we just lit something on fire? What do you think? Of course we would. Thank you, Katie. So the first combustion reaction we'll do is going to take place inside this empty water jug. It is completely empty. Nothing in it whatsoever, right? Think about this empty jug. I'll go ahead and turn it upside down. Is there anything in this jug? Anything at all? Think back to our states of matter. If you happen to be here for our frostology program, we talked about our states of matter. Is this completely empty? Some great guesses. I'm seeing a lot of people telling me that, in fact, this jug is not empty because it is still full of air. Um, there is some oxygen in here. There are some other gases, right? The gases that are making up our atmosphere, some of that nitrogen we talked about. And so um, we have some air inside our jug, which is actually very important when it comes to combustion. We'll touch on that a little bit more as we go. Now, I'm going to pour in one more ingredient for our combustion reaction, which is some ethanol. Um, ethanol is an alcohol. Uh, we can use it for fueling our cars. Um, it's a different kind of alcohol than we would find in hand sanitizer, um, but this stuff is highly flammable, but only when it's in its gaseous form. Um, now, in its liquid form, like I poured in, it's actually very hard to get it to light on fire. So if we want to use it for a combustion reaction, we need to start causing it to evaporate. If I swirl it around inside the jug, we talked about kinetic energy or that energy of motion. This kinetic energy is actually going to excite those molecules in this liquid, cause them to evaporate, giving us a nice flammable ethanol gas here inside the jug. So now that we have at least some flammable vapors, we said we don't want the liquid. So I'm going to dump out my excess, the extra liquid that's still left over inside. I didn't show you how much I had before, but there is a little bit less that's now inside this beaker, um, meaning we did have some good evaporation take place inside the jug. We'll move our excess fuel out of the way where it's nice and safe, put on my safety gloves, and we'll have our first combustion reaction in three, two, one. hoping you could hear something um, from here over the camera. Did you guys hear a noise? Yeah. We call this experiment the whoosh bottle. Um, so we saw that we had a combustion reaction because I'll tell you from here, the first part is I definitely feel heat. This bottle is now really, really warm. Um, you can tell me from home, did you see light? Awesome. So you saw light. I'm observing heat. There was a small amount of smoke that rose up out of this whoosh bottle. So this was definitely a combustion reaction. But it went out pretty quickly. Um, and to talk about why this reaction went out, and even if I were to put my gloves back on and try to relight this, so let's swirl around some of that, those fumes that are inside there. But 
let's see what happens if I try to ignite this reaction again. Notice we're not getting any reaction. We're not having another whoosh bottle um, and we're not having any more combustion. The reason for that is because we ran out of one piece of our fire triangle. Um, the fire triangle explains the three main ingredients to a combustion reaction. If you'd like to have combustion, you need three things. That's why we call it the fire triangle because a triangle has three sides, right? So if you look at a triangle, if you were to take away one of those sides, right, you don't have a triangle anymore. And just like in chemistry, if we were to remove one of those pieces from our combustion reaction, your combustion reaction would go out. It would run out of those ingredients that it needs in order to continue to completion. I know that you, I'm noticing that you guys know some of those pieces of our fire triangle in the chat. We're actually going to move through these pieces of the fire triangle one by one, and then we'll use them at the very end, put them all together in order to have a kaboom. So we'll be making our first, or we'll talk about the first part of the triangle, which is fuel. Um, so if you know about fuels, think about things we use for fuels, especially in combustion reactions or things that we can use to light on fire. Tell me in the chat, what is a good fuel? Gimbler said wood. That is a great fuel. Wood is the best fuel for your campfires. George told me oil. Great fuel. That is another really great fuel. Gasoline. Absolutely. The engine in your car, um, that runs off of a combustion reaction as well. So gasoline, sticks, right? We need different size sticks if we were to have a fire for a campfire. Gas. Hmm. Anyone else have a good example of a fuel? If not, I'm going to introduce, oh, bark, gunpowder. These are great examples of fuel. Houses are made of tons of things that are highly combustible, which is why we have to be very safe um, inside our homes, right? Houses are made of wood, some of these other highly flammable materials, like uh, if you have carpet, right? Carpet is made of fabric, and that's highly flammable as well. So we'll be talking about one of my favorite types of fuels, which is metals. Do you know that metals actually make great fuels? I see some other great guesses. Marshmallows, marshmallows are great fuels because they're full of sugar. Um, sugar is extremely flammable, which is why you never want to play with fire um, using candy or anything like that. Bug spray because it's an aerosol. But we'll be talking about metals. So I brought with me some metals to ignite today, um, but they don't look like the metals you might be used to. Normally when we think of metals, we think of things like the top of this fire extinguisher, right? They're hard and shiny, um, or maybe this container here, which is also made of metal. Um, but today I took my metals and I actually dissolved them into some solutions of salt. Um, I did this so that I could actually spray these metals through a flame. And so I have three different metals here. Um, and these three different metals are going to look different depending on where those metals lie on the periodic table. I know we had um, a note about the periodic table or a question about it um, in one of our last um, sessions. And so the periodic table arranges all the known elements that exist here on Earth. Um, metals are all on the periodic table. They're all kind of grouped together, but we organize everything on the periodic table in order of their number of protons and electrons. Now, these metals will all have different numbers of electrons um, or different placements of them orbiting around their atom. And so they're going to look different when they go through a combustion reaction, which is very, very cool. So we'll go ahead and I'm going to light my Bunsen burner here. I have a Bunsen burner, which runs off of butane. And let's make our first observation. Tell me what color is this butane flame? It's blue, good, I'm glad you can see that. This flame is a nice bright blue. Um, so we've got a nice bright blue flame, that's what we see when we have butane. And we'll start with our first metal, which is lithium. Now lithium, we find most often in cell phone batteries. So if you have an electronic device with a battery inside, that is a lithium ion battery. And let's see what might happen if we spray our lithium through this blue flame. Let's see. 
spray bottle going here. Sometimes they get a little clogged up sitting in our storage bin. No, oh, here it goes. What color do we observe using lithium? Yeah, it is a nice hot pink, almost red color. So this lithium, because of its electron configuration, when it goes through a combustion reaction, it produces hot pink wavelengths of light. The next metal we'll talk about is strontium. So I have strontium here in this container, um, and strontium we find most often in road flares. We used to use it in old tube televisions. So you, if you have an old um, television in your house, maybe from the 70s or 80s, there's strontium inside there. Um, if you have a newer TV, we don't use this metal anymore, but we still see it in road flares. So let's see what color we get. This one looks kind of similar to lithium, but hopefully you notice that it's more of an orange color. Um, this orange color is really great for telling you that you should take caution if you're driving and you see a road flare, right? This road flare is telling you that you should use caution, slow down, um, and keep an eye out for danger up ahead. That's why the police use them. Now, the last metal I have, I won't tell you what it is. Um, I'll spray it through the flame. Um, we'll observe the color, and then you tell me what metal you think this last metal salt is. So let's see. This one is my favorite because it is my favorite color, um, which is green. So we observe a pretty bright green flame, almost the same color as my virtual background here. Um, tell me what metal do you think burnt green when it is exposed to this butane torch? Think about metals that we know. Do you know anything that is big and green and made of metal. Hmm, some great guesses for copper, zinc, iron, sulfur or magnesium. Another guess for copper, brass, a great guess. Now brass is an alloy, we'll start with that one. Brass is an alloy, which is kind of an interesting one. Brass doesn't fall on our periodic table because it's actually a mixture of two different kinds of metal. So we actually use that to make brass, or use two metals to make brass. Sodium, another great guess for a metal. Um, if you guessed copper, you are correct. In the spray bottle, I have copper one chloride. Um, and copper one chloride actually burns green. Now, if you've ever heard of a place called New York City, and you know that there might be this big statue standing on the shore, it's very, very famous here in the States. Um, we call her the Statue of Liberty. Um, and the Statue of Liberty is made of copper. She's huge and big and bright green, but she wasn't always that way. Now, I know that in Canada, you guys have phased out the pennies, but I know that they still float around. So you've probably seen a penny before, um, our pennies, at least here in the States, and I think your pennies as well, those are actually coated with copper as well. But are those pennies green? No. They're not, right? They're kind of a rusty orange color. Um, and so was the Statue of Liberty at one time. Um, the Statue of Liberty, when they built it, was orange like a penny. But over time, the Statue of Liberty went through a very slow version of combustion that we call oxidation. She actually reacted with the oxygen in the air and it turned green over time. We did the same thing with our copper chloride here. It just went very, very quickly as we sprayed it through this flame and had a really, really fast version of oxidation. Um, so copper will burn green in a flame, even though naturally it looks more of that burnt orange and green color. Um, now, most pennies are zinc inside. So if you did um, mention that, most, uh, our, most pennies are zinc on the inside, but they're coated with a layer of copper. Uh, but we're phasing out pennies as we realize that we don't really need them as much and they're actually more expensive to make because of how um, expensive copper is, then they're actually worth. They're actually worth more than a penny, which is why we're starting to phase them out. Um, so that was the first part of our fire triangle, which was fuel. Um, so we talk a little bit about fuel and what makes good fuels. Now, these bright, colorful flames remind me of fireworks, and they actually use different metals in fireworks in order to cause them to burn different colors. Um, but if we want fireworks to be bright, um, we need to add a different kind of metal. So 
um, while these made the colors, so while the metals that we showed you here make them different colors, um, they don't burn incredibly bright. So we add a different metal that we call magnesium to the mix. Now, this one, I actually like doing this one over our virtual camera here because when we do this at the Science Center, this next metal actually burns so bright that you can't look at it with your naked eye. You're supposed to wear sunglasses. Um, so at the Science Center, we always ask that people look away and you can still tell how bright it is. But what's special about doing it over this camera is that the internet will actually take away that danger for us. And so you can actually look right at this reaction. I'm not going to look right at it. I'm gonna look right at the TV screen so it's in the corner of my eye. Um, and we're going to be burning a piece of magnesium. So magnesium is this next metal, it kind of looks silver um, right here in my studio, um, but it's going to burn incredibly bright. And this is what we add to fireworks to make them bright enough to see for miles away. I like to say expecto patronum while we go off with that one, if you're a Harry Potter fan like I am. Um, the very last metal I have to show you is just something for fun. If you enjoy fireworks, um, on your holidays, you might have seen something like this before as well. So tell me, what does this remind you of? Does this remind you of anything that maybe you've done outside on a summer day, maybe on a night that you have fireworks in your town? Oh, like birthday cakes? Yeah, like what are those things called that you see? Sparklers, exactly, you guys. Um, so it reminds you of sparklers, that last metal that was iron. Um, so we took iron and ground it down into a powder, which is the same thing that they coat sparklers with. Um, so they coat them with a layer of ground up iron filings, and then they burn and they kind of spark like that. So we call them sparklers. Um, so that's very, very fun. Um, and that brings us to the end of our fuel section um, here for our show. Now, we yeah. talked about fuel, yes. Do you think that this would be a good time for students to ask questions about the fuel? And I love that Baticus uh, says that he's Slytherin. Um, that was cool. Um, a good time to ask some questions about the um, fuels? Um, sure, we wanna ask questions just about fuel. So remember, we still have two more parts of our fire triangle here. So we'll take uh, two questions. If you guys have any questions about fuel, please post them in the chat. What is the most flammable fuel? I really don't know the answer to that question. I'm sure it depends on a few conditions that you're burning things in. So um, we're doing everything here at atmospheric pressure, but inside things like engines, you have um, either higher or lower pressure than the environment, which causes different fuels to be able to be ignited. So it probably depends on the conditions you're working in, but there are a lot of really highly flammable fuels that only things like, uh, or industries like the military use. Um, so there are, you know, explosives that we use for construction, um, but there's things like napalm that we've used in the military before. So those are all very, very high flammable. Okay, and the next question, what is the most dangerous combustion reaction that you have personally done? Ooh, great question. So we have something that we call our fire tornado. Um, and it's not that the reaction itself is very dangerous. You just have to be very careful when you set it up. Um, so I would say that if you were to do it without any knowledge or training on it, that's probably the most dangerous one that I've done. Um, but we are always being very safety minded. We always have our fire extinguishers ready. Um, but we do have something called the fire tornado, which is has the possibility of being the most dangerous. Awesome. Thanks, Anna. So we're excited to see the next part. Right, so now we're gonna move, move on um, and talk about how we could combine fuels in this next one. So um, I have a mason jar here um, that has a mixture or a solution of ethanol inside it. So solution means that it's at least two things mixed together. So um, this ethanol solution is half ethanol, half water. And we're going to be actually doing something that normally is considered pretty illegal. You're not supposed to do this, but since we're doing it for science and for education, we kind of get a free pass um, and we're actually going to be burning some U.S. currency. So um, you're not supposed to do this. Again, you can't try any of this at home, but since you can't try this at home and we can do it for science, I'll go ahead and I'm going to dunk my dollar down inside our ethanol solution. So if you remember ethanol, it's the same stuff that I put inside our um, whoosh bottle. 
And so our whoosh bottle, we know that this stuff is flammable, um, especially in its vapor form. So once I pull this dollar out of our reaction here, right, we know that it'll be now soaked with some really, really flammable fuels. So um, here in the US, we actually make our money out of some, the same stuff that we make our clothing out of. You guys know what we might make US currency out of? What kind of um, material? Polyester is a great guess. Not polyester though, not plastic. I know in Canada, you guys actually have more of like a plastic feeling of uh, paper currency now, which is really, really cool because I've tried to rip them in half and it's pretty difficult, but we actually don't use that here. Um, it's kind of a form of paper, um, but the ingredient that we use is actually cotton. So George Taylor told us that we actually make US currency out of cotton. Um, so cotton is really absorbent. If you own uh, cotton clothing, you know that it soaks up um, solutions really, really well. So we've got our dollar nice and soaked and let's go ahead and ignite that ethanol here. You can see that our dollar, it burns for maybe a second and then it just completely goes out. Um, that's because of this ethanol solution, right? The next part of the fire triangle that we need in order to have a combustion reaction is heat. Um, so water that I mixed into this ethanol solution is actually a great insulator. And this cotton dollar actually absorbed all of that um, water, which is insulating it from the heat. So water doesn't let things get very, very hot or very, very cold. And so it's actually insulating the dollar, protecting it from that barrier of heat which takes away one part of our fire triangle. Um, this dollar actually feels really cold to the touch, um, about the same temperature as the water that we started with, because water does not like to change temperature by very much. And so if you're missing heat from your fire triangle or you can't make your reaction hot enough, um, you'll actually put your reaction out. And so we burned away all the fuel on the outside of the dollar, and we're left with a totally safe dollar that I've now lit on fire probably a thousand times by now. So again, never try any of this at home. Um, you hate to burn your currency because if you, you know, by chance did catch your money on fire, uh, the government wouldn't like that very much and they probably won't give you a new one. So definitely don't burn your money away. Especially since yours is made of plastic. Plastic releases all sorts of fumes too. Um, so you would never ever want to burn plastic currency as well. Um, so we've talked about fuel. We've talked a little bit about heat, um, but even though we've talked about heat and why it's important for a fire, we should also talk about how heat can actually start a fire. So if you think about how we could generate heat um, just using our own body, right? The easiest way that I know how is just by rubbing your hands together. So if you're at home, go ahead and rub your hands together um, as quickly as you can, and you start to notice that you're creating or generating heat. He said that heat is just evidence of kinetic energy. And as your hands rub past each other, we create a force called friction, which turns that kinetic energy into heat. It is a result of that kinetic energy or evidence of that kinetic energy. So if you were to generate enough heat, you could actually start a fire. Thankfully, you can't generate that amount of heat with your hands, especially since our hands and our whole body is full of water. We're pretty well insulated. Um, so we couldn't do it just using that, but I do have um, two metal spheres to show you just how powerful that force of friction is. Now I have two rusty cannonballs here, one that is just plain and rusted on the outside, and one that I've wrapped in aluminum foil. Um, so what we can do with these two spheres is we're actually going to strike them against each other. Um, and when we strike them against each other, that friction of them rubbing against each other, just like our hands, is going to generate an incredible amount of heat. Now rust is again, one of those processes that we call oxidation. Just like the Statue of Liberty, this cannonball has now oxidized, meaning that there's oxygen all over the cannonball. When we strike these two together, we'll have kind of the perfect storm because we'll have that oxygen, we'll have heat, and then this aluminum is actually going to take the oxygen off of the rusty cannonball, uh, which can serve as a form of fuel. So the metals that are on the sphere are going to contribute to the reaction and we'll have a pretty awesome um, thermite 
reaction, which if you know someone who does welding, um, welding uses a thermite reaction. It burns incredibly hot, thousands of degrees, um, but we'll only be creating a very small, very rapid thermite reaction here. But you should get to see some pretty cool sparks. So let's give this a go. I might need to strike them a couple times and find a good spot on our cannonball here. Um, but here is our thermite reaction. See the sparks flying off of this reaction? Um, you'll notice that my cannonball right here now has a big hole in it um, and it's pretty burnt and I can actually smell the combustion reaction that took place. So it's really just the aluminum on this sphere stealing the oxygen from this cannonball um, and the heat that I'm providing by converting all of my mechanical energy swinging my arms um, to one small point on the sphere provides enough heat to create a pretty amazing thermite reaction. So always keep in mind that while heat is important for combustion reactions, if you have enough of it, that could actually be the source of your fire. So always be very, very careful. Now we have to talk about the last part of our fire triangle, which we mentioned during that reaction, which is oxygen. To demonstrate this, I have a highly flammable powder with um, so instead of using a liquid like our ethanol, like we've been doing so far, uh, we're actually going to ignite a solid. Um, this stuff is called lycopodium, L-Y-C-O-P-O-D-I-U-M. Um, you can only really get it from a, med or a scientific supply store like Flynn Scientific, where we got ours. But this stuff does grow from a spore of a moss plant that we find in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, so this is a spore. From a plant, but since organic matters like wood are highly flammable, I should read you the safety precaution. It says, danger, flammable solid, keep away from heat, spark, and open flames. Be aware of the potential for a dust explosion. I don't know, what do you guys think? Should we listen to the safety precautions or should we light it on fire? What do you think? I'll let you guys decide. An overwhelming response for we should probably light it on fire. If you do say listen to the safety precautions, I promise um, I will wear all of my safety equipment. We'll make sure we're taking those precautions as we need. Um, but we will go ahead and light this on fire. Why else would I bring it, right? Because so, Philip, Philip had just reminded you to put your gloves on. Oh, absolutely. Like I said, my gloves are kind of cumbersome, so I can't use my gloves um, when I'm getting set up. But I will definitely put them on since this stuff is so highly flammable. So I've got just a watch glass here, um, just an empty watch glass, and I've put some of that lycopodium down into this dropper. And so it's said it's highly flammable, so we'll add just a little bit to the watch glass there. That should be plenty. Go ahead and put my gloves back on um, so I can actually show you guys this lycopodium. And are you guys ready for a dust explosion like it warned us for? Here we go. In three, two. Hmm. Interesting. Right now, it's kind of tricky to see, but there has been a small amount of combustion. If you can see the top of my lycopodium, it's not as bright yellow as we started with. Um, it's kind of toasted on the top, like kind of toasted like a marshmallow. Um, it smells kind of like a marshmallow too, um, but we didn't really have this exciting dust explosion that the bottle promised us, did we? So let's, let's think about the parts of our fire triangle. Uh, we have to have a fuel, right? And this lycopodium, the bottle warned us already that this stuff is a great fuel. It's got this big warning on it that it's highly flammable. So we know we have fuel. Um, I have a lighter. And so I definitely have an ignition source or a source of heat for our reaction. And everyone take a deep breath. Let's double check that there's oxygen in the air. So I haven't fallen to the ground, and so the room still has oxygen in it. Um, but the problem is the amount of oxygen. So this lycopodium is a really, really fine powder, almost like powdered sugar. Um, and if you've ever seen, there are YouTube videos of this, powdered sugar can be extremely dangerous. You should never put powdered 
syrup sugar on a birthday cake that has candles because when it becomes airborne, it can be extremely flammable and give you one of those dust explosions that this bottle is warning us for. But since the powder is so fine, it's sitting too tightly packed on itself, which means only the top of the lycopodium is exposed to the air. Um, only the top of it has oxygen that's near it so that it can burn. If we want to burn all of the lycopodium, right, we need to push the lycopodium into the air, spread those molecules out so that you can actually have oxygen on all sides, causing all of the lycopodium to burn. So we need a way to introduce more oxygen into this or propel our lycopodium into the air. And for that, I've built this device, which is just a lighter with a long plastic straw on it. So we've got a long straw here, um, and we're actually going to put the lycopodium into the straw. And then I'll be using the air inside my lungs in order to propel it. So I'm going to blow air through the straw, sending the lycopodium through the flame, surrounding it on all sides with that very last part of our fire triangle, which is oxygen, um, and causing a pretty big fireball. Um, are you guys ready to see a giant fireball? All right. See Gabriel's ready. I see George is ready. See a few of our friends are ready. Now, let's do a countdown for this fireball. But instead of saying three, two, one, because we do that one all the time, um, let's do the three parts of the fire triangle. Three parts that we've learned today are fuel, heat, oxygen. Let's do one practice with our countdown. So if you are at home, let's say those three parts of our triangle together. Fuel, heat, oxygen. All right, now if you guys are ready, I'm ready. Join with me at home in fuel, heat, oxygen. Whoa, right? So when we combine all three parts of our fire triangle, um, propelling our fuel through the air, um, we get a pretty amazing um, reaction here. Now, I did promise that I had one experiment that you are allowed to try at home. So before we get to our final kaboom part of the show, I'd love to teach you how to make a safe explosion that you can do at your house. Uh, this is using uh, materials that you might have at home. So for this reaction, all you'll need are some film canisters. So I have two film canisters here. If you don't know what a film canister is, um, we used to use them back before we had digital cameras or cameras on our cell phone. Um, you're used to put your film from your camera inside this little tube, um, take it with you to the store so that you can have someone develop and print your photos for you. Now we don't use these anymore. So if you know someone in your life who used to have a film camera, they might have some film canisters laying around that you might be able to borrow, or maybe they would be willing to. Um, if you don't have a film canister, I've tried to come up with a few other suggestions for what you might be able to use for this. Um, if you have a pill bottle that has a press-on lid, so it can't be a screw cap, um, it has to be something that has a pressure fit lid, something that snaps on, or you can try looking for a small Tupperware container. Now we're going to turn these film canisters into rockets because rockets run off of explosions. We rely on Newton's third, or Newton's laws in order to launch rockets. Um, and one of Newton's laws tells us that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. So we're going to create an explosion inside this tube. And the explosion is going to push down on the ground, which then has an equal and opposite push on the rocket, sending it flying up into the sky. So our film canister is going to be our rocket and then our rocket fuel, what we're going to use to create an explosion is Alka-Seltzer. Um, so Alka-Seltzer you can get at any sort of drugstore or grocery store. Um, you might already have some at home. We use this for if people have an upset stomach, you dissolve it in water, it starts to fizz and bubble um, and it will help to soothe your stomach. Um, and so we're going to be taking the Alka-Seltzer dissolving it in some water inside this reactions, which is going to generate a gas. So if you think back to our liquid nitrogen presentation, if you were there for that, if not, we talked about how when things turn into a gas, they expand, they take up more space. So 
we trap that expansion of gases in a closed container, like a film canister, um, you can actually cause an explosion to happen. So you don't need any fire in order to have an explosion. All you need is that expansion of gases in a closed container. Um, so a pill bottle should work. Remember that it has to be a snap-on lid. So um, if you know someone who would maybe donate you an empty bottle that has a snap-on lid, it can't be something that twists on because the, the pressure that builds inside can't um, untwist the lid. So yeah, nothing with the safety lock, but you can use one that has a press on lid. Um, otherwise, those little portion cups or condiment cups um, that sometimes you get from restaurants that have the little snap on lids, those would work as well. Um, all right, so we filled our film canisters about halfway full with water, and then in each one we'll drop in um, just a little piece of Alka-Seltzer. And the Alka-Seltzer is starting to create a gas. It's starting to fizz and to bubble. Um, that's what makes Alka-Seltzer so effective. Um, and we're going to wait for the pressure to build. We'll start our next reaction here. And they take about a minute to go off. Um, so right now that pressure is building inside the tube. It's filling that container to the point where eventually the container won't be able to handle the pressure. When the pressure becomes greater than the force of that snap-on lid, then the reaction is going to explode. It's going to pop the lid right off the film canister. I'm gonna send it flying into the sky. You never wanna look over this reaction, right? You saw just how powerful that reaction was. We'll scoot this one over just a little bit. Um, and there they go. So it's an incredibly fun reaction. If you don't have something like a tray or a plastic container to do this reaction in, I highly recommend doing this experiment outside where you don't have to worry about the mess that it creates. Um, of course, you'll always want to go pick up your rocket because it's made of plastic. We never want to litter. Um, and if you do own something like a pair of safety glasses, I highly recommend wearing them. If you don't have safety glasses and you're outside, sunglasses will work just fine. It's just there to protect you from something uh, coming up and hitting you in the eyes. Um, the, the liquid and the gas that's created is not going to hurt you at all. It's just water and Alka-Seltzer. Um, but always be safe. Always do this reaction outside if you're able, um, especially right now. It's great to go outside and get some fresh air, especially if the weather is nice um, to try a reaction like this. So that was your at home safe version of an explosion. But I did promise you that we'll make something go kaboom today. Um, we will be having our kaboom, which will be the grand finale of our show, using this empty coffee canister here. Um, this one is not the same coffee canister we used during frostology. Um, the only difference is I poked a tiny little hole in the back. Now, this coffee canister was empty. It was completely empty, except for air. Um, but I did add in just a little bit of water. If you think back to um, what we talked about with the dollar bill, we said that water prevents fire. We use water to put out fires. Um, we can use water to prevent fires by using it as an insulator um, to block heat. But in this case, we need the water so that we can create our rocket fuel or our kaboomistry fuel. Um, I'm clearing things off my table because this reaction can be just a little bit messy um, because the fuel that we're creating is something called acetylene gas. We're going to create it by dissolving this calcium carbide, which is kind of a smelly gray rock. Um, again, it's something that's produced in a lab, so I bought it from a scientific store or a science industry store. Um, now that I've got most of my things out of the way, especially my electronics like my mouse and my computer keyboard. All right, we are going to go ahead with our very last combustion reaction. Once I find my hearing protection, which I'm certain that I pulled out. Hmm. Ah, let me hold for one moment while I find my hearing protection. No, I pulled it out here somewhere. There it is. All right. Now, here in my studio, this reaction is going to be extremely, extremely loud. Um, this is the reason we call this show Kaboomistry. Um, so I'm putting on my hearing protection. Over the camera, you should be safe at home, but you, if you are uncomfortable with loud noises or they scare you, um, this is a great time to cover up your ears. Um, I'll give us a countdown if you want to wait for that countdown. Um, then you can cover up your ears for us. Now, we're going to create our fuel. 
using our calcium carbide here, dissolve it in water, trap that gas inside the container using this lid, and then we're going to ignite it using this little spark generator here. All right, so we've got our calcium carbide generating our fuel inside our container. I all of my electronics. Go ahead, pop on our lid, trap that gas inside, and we'll go ahead with our carbide cannon in three, two, one. Kaboom! Hopefully it wasn't too loud for you at home. Um, it was extremely loud right here in my studio. Um, but they say that every good show should end with a bang, and that was mine. So that is about the end of Kaboomistry. Um, but if we want to answer any questions that you might have, um, we can go ahead and do that now. So if you do have any questions, I'll turn it over to you, Molly, um, if you'd like to facilitate that. That was such a great big bang, as Gibbler said. Like, oh, it was so fun to see that and that... Um that you also taught us a lot of safety tricks as well. So we really appreciate that. Um, can we, um, if we have any questions for Anna, if you would like to type them in the chat, we maybe have time for three or four, but we are working on a way for us to have um, a Q&A on our website that we're going to share with Anna and we're going to see Anna again and again and again through Connected North. Um, so, um, uh, I have a question, Mally. Yeah, Cameron, do you, uh, Cameron says, do you ever have some experiments that don't work? Yes, all the time, Cameron. Let me tell you that sometimes I go through this whole show and sometimes I have to try every experiment twice because there's just all these things called variables. You know, sometimes you don't account for having enough fuel. Um, sometimes if I let the gas simmer inside this container for too long, it actually will push all the oxygen out of the hole. Um, so this carbide cannon doesn't always work on the first try, but what's nice about science is that you should never give up just because something goes wrong once. Um, you always think about your variables, assess the situation, go back and try it again. So in that case, all we have to do is take the lid off, add more oxygen to the reaction, trap it back inside and light it right away. And so things go wrong all the time. Um, like we said, we're always prepared because we don't want things to go wrong in a way that could be harmful to someone. So we're always being safe. Um, but sometimes experiments just don't work and that's okay. That's, that's how we learn, which we've learned a lot this week. So the Sev said he liked the boom and Kerrigan said that she wanted to see more kaboomistry. So I think next week we're doing kitchen chemistry that they can do their own experiments. Um, we'll work with fire during that one, but we will do some kitchen chemistry, so just some different chemical reactions that you can do at home to get some pretty crazy science experiment results. It would be really fun. Uh, Gibbler wants to know, what is the biggest explosion you've ever seen? In person, I'd say the biggest explosion I've ever seen is the liquid nitrogen ball explosion. So I think we talked about it a little during Frostology that you can put some liquid nitrogen in a big two liter bottle seal the lid really really tight and throw it into some warm water and the gas will expand so quickly that it shrapnels the plastic bottle um, and it creates a really huge explosion which is really easy to see so it's it's pretty fun um you have to be very very safe when you do it and make sure you're trained but it's really really exciting that's cool and uh the q m wants to know um have you ever gotten hurt during your science experiments not i'm very very i'm very fortunate um that i've been trained by people who um have a lot of knowledge on science um and i'm you know like i said i'm always very concerned about safety especially since i'm doing them um, with you at home i would never want to hurt myself on camera um, we're always protecting ourselves by wearing our safety equipment so i'm very lucky i've never been hurt sometimes people do get hurt even if they're taking all of their own safety precautions um science like we said there's lots of variables that go into it i'm very lucky i've never been hurt and we're glad too. So we want to thank you, Anna, for such an amazing presentation. It was great and we can't wait to see you again in a few days. But we had some questions in the chat about what's coming up today. So at 1130 Central, 1230 Eastern, we have sharks. And um, a little bit after that at 115 Central, 215 Eastern, we have 
drawing a shark and at 2.30 Central, 3.30 Eastern, we have dinosaur. So as Anna said, it's a really scientific day today. And then at the end of the day, we have coding. So it's all on the website. And we're so thankful that you're here. And thank you, Anna, for, for starting off our Connected North at home on Monday and finishing with us on Friday. We really appreciate you. So thank you.